I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Garrick Jones. He is the president of the Huddle Up Foundation of Houston, which was created by former NFL athletes to help young athletes with their branding, financial literacy, and just a better understanding of life in general to keep them away from unnecessary bumps and bruises that we all experience. I want to find out how this program works, what his role is, and if he has, especially since he had five years of NFL experience, five years of CFL experience, if he has any other aspirations. Join me in this conversation with Garrick Jones. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Mr. Garrick Jones. Good day, fine sir. Hey, good day to you, man. Thank you for having me. No, I thank you. And we do not know each other, but what little I do know of you and you know of me, you are a gracious man. I know that right from the get-go. I canceled our meeting the other day, and then I was a little bit late on you even coming earlier today. So I know you're a gracious man, and I, I truly thank you for um, giving me the time, the opportunity to have a little conversation today with you about work. Uh, not a problem, man. Not a problem at all. I'm going to do an introduction about you in, in the end, and I'm going to throw it at the front. Usually I do it before, but because I was late, I didn't get to do it. So could you fill us in a little bit more, and, and I'll do my best to give you the best introduction I could possibly do when I do do that, and just fill us in on the type of work you're doing now and maybe what a little bit that led you to it. Okay. Well, the type of work that I'm uh, currently doing right now is I'm doing a lot on the philanthropic side, but also on the, I think, cutting edge and forward thinking side of, of professional sports uh, in regards to revenue generation for athletes and their families, as well as uh, different professional leagues. Uh, I have a developmental football league called the States Developmental Football League, where we focus on uh, uh, the business aspect of it for the players and their families. Uh, also, uh, financial literacy, business acumen, uh, we talk about, you know, just a curriculum that will give them the opportunity to be successful when their careers are over um, because the careers, you know, for pe professional football players are pretty quick. Uh, I like to say that it's the, the, the uh, best temporary job you'll ever have. Um, but ultimately, you know, that's the space that I came from. But I, I've been a business consultant for a number of years. Uh, I started my first business in the ninth grade, which is a, uh, a uh, design business, marketing, promotion, graphic design. Uh, situation. So my thing has always been about educating and teaching and, and teaching from testimony. Um, and, and that's really what, where I am in the spaces that I'm in. You know, it's all about giving back. It's all about educating. It's all about exposing to, and, and it's all about creating that movement like that. So I think that's the quickest way that I can, I can say about everything, but it's, it's a lot deeper, but um, that's primarily where I am space-wise. Mr. Jones, you mentioned grade nine, and that's what I like to take people back as far as they can go to their very first job. Was, was that your first job? Like whether it was making money or not, like sometimes people are just going out and doing things out of the house on their own. Was that your first right. job? No, actually, uh, my first real job was a, a lawn cutting service that my father started, you know, the get my brothers and I out of the house during the yeah. summertime. Uh, you know, we would go around the neighborhood and cut grass and, you know, he would work with us. Yeah. And that gave us an opportunity to start learning about business and being responsible and payrolls and you know, all the different things like that. But for me, I think that was my first real job that I, I, I received a paycheck, which was really cool. It's something that always just stuck with me. Um, and uh, it just, the work ethic that, you know, he instilled in us, was really good, you know, as I look back now and in the different endeavors that I'm a part of now and things that I'm trying to take on, um, you know, that's kind of the attitude that I've had my entire life. Like, you know, you, you won't outwork me. And, and we, that's been the, the mantra for so long, you know? So you say your, your dad started it up with you and your brother, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how did he, maybe present that to you or, you know, pull you out of the house for the first cutting of the lawn? How did that go about? Uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't a recruitment process. I can tell you that it wasn't a, you know, fly me to the, uh, to the next city and wind me and dine me. I want to type of thing. So it, 
the recruitment process was real smooth. It was, <laughs> it was on it his was, side, right? Exactly. No, I, man. Until this day, it, it, I think things would go a lot smoother if everybody was able to operate like that. But um, realistically, man, he had the plan, and then yeah. we and we we couldn't refuse it. I can tell you that much. So, <laughs> so, so when you talk about not outdoing the other guys, so did you and your brother start competing with each other? Was that something that started to develop as well? Uh, you know, I think so. I'm the youngest of, of two older brothers. Uh, so, and, and, they, and they were in the sports really, really heavy, you know, younger, in younger days. And I really didn't come into sports until, ooh, I want to say junior high, you know, going into, you know, my high school years. And then I kind of got that competitive bug, but, um, but yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it's just one of the things being competitive is, is something you're born with. And, uh, you know, me being a former professional athlete, um, those are things that drove us, you know, and my brothers, they were really the athletes and should have been the, the NFL players and should have been the MLB and M NBA players, but you know, they chose to go a different route. Um, but we've all, always been competitive, man. And that's, I think that's, that's one of the things that, that sets me apart. You know, knowing myself, my competitiveness, and and how to how to drill down on that when the time comes, when it's needed. How how many summers did you last with your dad's business? Because I know you said you. <laughs> I, I think we did three, if I'm not mistaken. You know, I think we did three solid summers. I had a couple of friends that jumped in with us uh, a couple of times, but then you know, uh, he started paying us in ice cream cones after he paid us in money the first time around. So we was like, I don't know, man. So we kind of <laughs> we kind of had to form a union. I think once we formed a union, you know, things kind of said, uh, you know, you know, I think we need to shut this down. So. And then you got your, was that the next job you mentioned? Or what was another couple of jobs you got into middle school? You said fashion design? Uh, yeah, in the ninth grade, uh, a buddy of mine, uh, we we started a, a graphics design business graphics. called Southern Flavor Images. And what we were doing was we were, we had so many different friends that were wanting to do different things and really didn't know. And at that time we were in that same boat, but you know, we were idealistic, opportunistic. Yeah. We were uh, ambitious. So we just started really teaching ourselves uh, a lot of different things. And back then you didn't have the internet. So you had to do a lot of reading, mm -hmm. libraries, uh, those types of things. And, and that's what we did, man. And, and, and to this day, uh, you know, people, you know, reach out to us, uh, you know, as far as consulting, as far as imaging, as far as branding. And those are some of the things that I've, I've yeah. taken into my league when it comes down to these players, you know, teaching them how to be a brand within a brand, how to market and promote themselves and themselves and also have a, a, a social, uh, social proof uh, of different things that you do. So, and it's just carried over through all the years, man. It's been a, it's been a good time. I'd like to ask you a few questions, questions about what you're doing now, but even still chronicling your workflow into how you made it into, say, the NFL and CFL. When did right. that start to really take, take notice, whether recruits or yourself, something that you wanted to take seriously, or is it just something you kind of stumbled into? I think it, I think it was a, a evolution, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I think with how my career, uh, came about, uh, it's just a combination of everything that I had went through, you know, beforehand and being able to do so many different things really helped me because I didn't necessarily have to wait on, you know, people to help me uh, a lot of times, which really was good. You know, when it came down to putting my packages together, mm -hmm. learning how to market and promote myself, uh, you know, because those are things that I had done, you know for so many years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I essentially learned how to brand. And this was a VHS ta tape. Was it oh yeah. You better believe right? it. These were, these were yeah. VHSs, man. And, and, and black and white copies and, you know, you know, stopping at Kinko's and all those different things, man. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was ready for it. So now it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, it, and that's the thing that, that is really cool is I just, I've been able to see, you know, the maturation of, 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 of technology and how it can help, you know, athletes, their families, and, and everybody associated with, with what, what's going on. So I don't want to ask you too many questions about your career in the NFL and CFL, because I'm sure you've had so many questions. But as you transitioned into and out of professional football, how did you bring some of that um, character building 
traits that you now have and bring in and pour into these other athletes and these other people that you're helping out? How did you, you know, kind of bring those good things with you? Well, the thing about it is, is there are going to be X amount of athletes every year trying to get to the NFL and less than 1% of all athletes across the world make it. Mm-hmm. And of those 1% that do make it, you know, uh, of all those athletes that are trying to make it only 256 to 257 of those guys will be drafted in the NFL. So the numbers are, are, are really lopsided. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that I looked at by the way I made it to the NFL being undrafted without a senior season of college. I, I saw it from a, an entirely different scope than a lot of other athletes that are in the NFL or had made it to the NFL at that time because either they were drafted, went to major universities, um, and, and had the opportunity to go in and, and have those luxuries that I wasn't afforded um, just by, you know, from what, what I went through. Yeah. So when I got there and just talking to different guys and, and being on that circuit of, you know, going into camp and getting released and, having to figure out what the next move was, I looked at it and said, if I ever had the opportunity to, to put a league together, those were the things that I was, I was going to really focus on, you know, for athletes because there are some really good athletes, but because of the numbers mm-hmm. game, mm-hmm. a lot of those guys get cut. So I knew that there would be really an unlimited supply of athletes uh, every year because every year there's a new cycle and these numbers are compounded. So what I wanted to do was be unlike any other league and, and really set it up to where when they come in, we're using football as the carrot. You know, they want to come to try to get to the NFL, but 99% of those guys aren't going to mm-hmm. make it. So, but 100% are going to have Bill, Bill's babies and problems. So we said we wanted to focus on those aspects. We wanted to teach them everything that we've learned in business and in sports and, and, and make sure that they understood how it applied when they were done playing because you can't play it forever. Um, but you will, you know, be a former player a lot longer than you'll be a current player. And that's one of the things that that's one of the pillars uh, of what we do. And and that whole branding situation and things that I've been through is just teaching from that testimony, because I'm a firm believer in if I've never been there before, how could I show you? So that's 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 what I do. Uh, that's what I'm doing right now with my with my GM push. Uh, trying to get into the NFL as a general manager because I've started my own league. I've scouted. uh, I've worked with athletes. I I am an athlete. So the connection there is is really unreal. Um, I've worked with different businesses as far as consulting, uh, and and I've helped individuals and organizations in in regards to diversity and inclusion. I mean, anything you can think of when it comes down Mm -hmm. to a leader, um, those are the things that that, that I'm built from, and and that's what, what has happened. If anyone doesn't have an understanding, I grew up watching Rudy. I'm just a little guy. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'll put myself in, like, I tried for a football team or university football team got cut, you know, wasn't recruited, but then eventually made it pr- pretty happy. But what I think about most often is like the movie, the, the documentary Hard Knocks. Mm-hmm. And the, the heart wrenching is those guys that are trying that weren't recruited, right. right? And they didn't go to the big, right. but they're given their heart, right? And and some could right. say given more heart than these guys that, you know, I, you would probably know better than I would. There's right. some, you know, guys given 100% no matter where they come from or where, right. whatever situation they're in. But some of these guys that weren't drafted, they're given 110%. And then if they're cut or if they get injured or something along those lines, but even better when they do make it like yourself, but then the ones even after a career and what you're doing is you're giving them an opportunity right from the beginning to say, listen, mm-hmm. despite how your career goes, you do have babies and bills. And what was the other one? Uh, problems. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> I should know that one. <laughs> all right. Everybody should know that got one. problems. It Man. Doesn't matter. Hey, that's <laughs> universal, right? <laughs> <laughs> babies and bills and problems. And we all have them and you're setting, And I love that because you hear so many tragic stories. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't even matter what type of work, but you do hear it in sports Mm -hmm. a lot because people get these big paychecks and then people running out of money, going bankrupt, getting, but you're showing them a path. You're giving, can you speak more about how you're giving them? I I saw on your your site, 
financial literacy? Because I think that's important. Mm-hmm. And it's something I lack. I know that for a fact. And how yeah. is it that you guys develop these programs? And what is it, would it look like for maybe an athlete? Right. So the way we came up with these things was we knew that all these athletes were having problems, myself included. Yeah. Um, everything that you hear about, man, I've gone through it. Um, and in doing so and, and being, you know, of an entrepreneurial type of uh, bloodline for myself, yeah. uh, even I had problems because I was never exposed to those practices like financial literacy at a young age. Uh, I, I was exposed to hard work, you know, uh, but my parents, they were working, you know, and there, there was never really classes or seminars or webinars for me to get into as a youngster. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the things that we wanted to bring to the table for the athletes. We wanted our league to be so different that when you look at other leagues compared to what we do, they're just playing football, which that's the case. Um, case in point, you know, our schedules will be bi-weekly. Um, so that gives us an opportunity to play the game, but the next week really get them in a classroom setting and, and, and focus on learning about finances, learning about insurance, learning about uh, uh, different aspects of trust, learning about different aspects when it comes down to um, um, commission structures from businesses, setting up your own brick and mortar businesses, franchising, uh, and also leveraging you know, whatever you've done in the past, you know, whether they were a Pee Wee All or All American or an All Pro, they have a following that can be leveraged and monetized. And guys don't know that. And, and with this day and age, with, you know, the computers and, and the internet and the connections the way they are from a global standpoint, guys are not maximizing what they've done in the past. Uh, and that's what we wanted to do as a league give them every opportunity to be successful and make money from every aspect of our league not just us paying them a paycheck, but them getting into, you know, profit sharing per game, uh, taking the helmet off and then really getting out in, in the community and having a connection with their fans. Uh, those are all the things that help uh, establish them more in the communities and establish them more uh, uh, in a business sense and an overall development, a holistic approach. And leagues weren't doing that. You know, all the leagues that I play for, it was about the X's and O's in the bottom line, unfortunately. So I said, hey, This is how this will go um, because this is something that's needed. And and this is the reason why, you know, once I get a chance to sit down with the, the, the upper management with the NFL and, and, and and whoever else, they'll be able to see that the heavy lifting has been done. And it's something that can just be a a plug and play scenario for them and give them an opportunity to develop their players on the field and off the field. And And it just works for everybody because that's another revenue stream for the NFL. And with, COVID going on right now, I think they need to get as creative as possible when it comes down to uh, generating revenue. And and we have the answer. I had this question a long time ago, and I think you're the perfect guy to maybe answer it or even direct me to what might be my right mindset. Okay. But is there a responsibility? There is a responsibility on the, the individual athlete to manage his money, but is there a responsibility on an agent you know, an owner or something to strongly encourage some athletes to take a portion and invest it for their future, like long-term 20, you're like, take this, or is there something in place that says, okay, you, I mean, not you must, but there's a program for them, or is this what, this is the kernel of what you're trying to get going. So there is something there. So people are looking longer than their usually five, five year career. Right. Well, you have to look at it like this. The majority of the, the, the young men that are playing in the game today come from areas that uh, it's, it's been about surviving and not necessarily thriving. Mm-hmm. And in order for them to get out of those areas, um, they either have to be a very good vocalist. Uh, they either have to be a, a very good basketball player or a good football player. So everything is physical, right? And um, they're not necessarily exposed to all of the other ways to generate money for their family Mm -hmm. Um, outside of, you know, maybe some unsavory type of situations, a hustle or, you know, some some things that will land you in jail. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate. Um, And and, and in that, once uh, I think people figure out that these athletes are are, are top tier athletes, 
you begin to go through a system that is or pushing you through right and then you're not necessarily thinking about anything other than football and how you're going to get out so it's a perfect storm for a disaster later on mm -hmm. down the road mm -hmm. uh, and by the time you get to the nfl that's been your focal point um and once you get the money and once you have the payday you know if you've lived your entire life where you didn't have a bank account or you may have had forty dollars in a bank account then all of a sudden you got 40 million you're going to look at that 40 million the same way you look at that 40 dollars mm -hmm. uh, and then the people that are around you and surrounded by you haven't been exposed to financial literacy and business and, and, and investments and all those different things like that. Uh, so you have a perfect storm right there. So you have the agents, you have the financial advisors, you have these teams, and we'll start with the teams and leagues. There, there are billions of dollars that are generated, you know, from these young men and young women that are playing the sport. And by the time they're done, which, the NFL itself is the best temporary job you'll ever have. It's quick. You know, three and a half years is, three and the, and a half. I'd say, the minimum, right? Mm -hmm. um, by the time you're done, you're still young. You still have not crossed over into a, 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 a mind frame of understanding how to take care of yourself, let alone your family. Uh, and, and the people around you are still in that same space. So uh, to offset that, it's about education. It's about exposure, too. So all of the things that I've been exposed to uh, after my life in professional sports is what we brought to the table, uh, co-founder myself, uh, Byron Clay, uh, in business. And so we, we married free enterprise, free enterprise plus football. And with that and in doing that, um, you get the opportunity to show the athletes an entirely different mindset where we're reprogramming them from wanting to be employees to, to want, wanting to be employers, uh, wanting to have ownership. Um, and, and doing it through the sport that they love uh, because the way we have it set up and structured, they'll be able to make as much money as they want and they want, then they'll create generational wealth. That's the biggest thing, things that can be passed down. And that's not just mo monetarily, uh, that's from knowledge as well. Uh, and that's how you get the opportunity to help all of the athletes. But in doing so, uh, all of those revenue streams that will be going uh, are now, you know, they're, they're, they're pieces of that and percentages of that that come back to the league. So whether the athlete is playing with us or not, uh, and they're running their businesses 30, 40 years down the road, there are still percentages of what he does coming back to our league because we taught him how to hunt and we put him in a position to take care of his family and, and not just had him on the field and said, okay, well, here's your paycheck and good luck to you, all those things. So uh, I think there should be a mandate for all of them to come together and make mm -hmm. sure that these athletes are good because if you do that, you, you put yourself in a position to really benefit from what that athlete is going to do after he plays ball. And that's where the magic really does happen. And, and people don't really understand that when you're done playing, you, you have more time to, to be in the community and do a lot of things and you no longer have the helmet on. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it's a, uh, the rabbit hole is deep. I'll put it to you like that. Um, but I think once I'm able to sit down with the NFL, once I'm able to sit down with these teams that, are interested in me being a GM, um, we're going to be able to show them a lot of things that will offset, you know, what's happening, you know, because we have it set up to whether we, whether we have one or 1 million or 1,000 or a uh, or hundred thousand people in the stands, uh, we'll still be profitable. It's just about making sure that your players are in a good place because they will essentially keep you going in times of despair and, and economic downturn. Garrick, maybe I missed it, but you're speaking of your league that you're creating or have created. What does mm -hmm. that look like in, in actual playing and scheduling? Uh, well, our deal is this. Um, from my experiences, when you go to camp, uh, especially now in the NFL, they'll come to camp with 90 guys, mm -hmm. and they have to whittle it down to 53 men. Mm -hmm. What happens is you lose a lot of those guys that you had that were really good players yep. to numbers. And when they're cut, these teams now are focusing on the season, so they don't have the opportunity to understand and, and know where these players go. So what we did was we said we want to run congruent with the CFL season and the NFL season. So when you cut these players, these teams can allocate those guys to our teams, and they'll be able to develop on and off the field and be mentored by former professional athletes that mm -hmm. are coaches, that are scouts, uh, uh, and, and develop in such a way to where when the injury bug hits, these teams can pull them right back up and they know where they are. 
Uh, they're running the same schemes as the teams that they came from, all those things. So we've taken our time with putting together this platform mm -hmm. in order to mesh with the NFL and what the CFL was doing and, and give them a, a, a feeder system, if you will, um, uh, uh, of talent, uh, not only on the field with the players, but with the referees, with upper management, you know, the interns and those types of things that they may not be able to have and house in the NFL, if they have good candidates, they can actually allocate all these candidates into what we're doing so they can learn the ropes. And that's exactly why we started the league, because I wanted to learn everything that had to, to go on with running a league, uh, being a general manager, all those aspects, scouting, um, because I was doing that and learning on the job when I was playing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I was uh, privately scouting, you know, guys would call me up and say, hey, man, who you got? Uh, give us a report on him. You know, anytime they come to Houston or Little Rock or wherever I was, I've had scouts from all teams call me, and, and, and I've dealt with them. And I've, I've, I, that's how I was scouting. Instead of scouting and, and, and talent evaluation with one team, I said I wanted to work with all the teams and all the leagues because my thing is universal. I didn't want to compartmentalize myself with just one thought process from one mm -hmm. team and those athletes because I knew the numbers of athletes were already disproportionate. Uh, so that's how we work, man. We work uh, congruently with the with the NFL and the CFL in their seasons. And we played a couple of seasons, but we beta tested those seasons to see what worked and what didn't work mm -hmm. uh, because we wanted to have a complete project and a complete pl platform when we actually sat down with the leagues and says, this is what this is what this is and this is how it can help. You, you mentioned <clears throat> GM or general manager position. Do you see some stones that you need to to cross before you get there some some pathways or maybe certain positions <clears throat> that you'd like to get into because I, I can't imagine it would be horribly difficult to get at least close to being a gm there's only so many gm positions but right. at least getting into being some assistant and working your way through the system but you're not you're not in working particularly in the NFL at the mm -hmm. moment. So right. do you see some um, stones that you need to skip across first? Well, that you would like to, if you, if you, <clears throat> and this is what I did, you know, right now I'm in the process of uh, petitioning to be the uh, next general manager for the Houston Texans. Good. good. And in doing so, uh, I opened a door that nobody has done before in regards to the fans and being able to connect with the fans. And when I sat down and I looked at my body of work, my body of work is just as robust or even more robust than a lot of guys that went through the ranks mm -hmm. the traditional way. Okay. So when it comes down to what's needed um, in a general manager position, I know what the workload is for everybody in the building. When the general manager candidates that they may bring in now they may know just the football operations mm -hmm. aspect of it. And, and, and a general manager position is about leadership and delegating and bringing the right people in that are going to be stellar uh, at those positions under you. It's like capologists. It's like uh, player personnel. Uh, it's like pro personnel. You have to have people that will sharpen you, but you got to understand that everything and how everything works in the building from a, in the building from a football ops perspective. Uh, but you have to be a leader and be able to tie all that together to bring the culture, to, to set the tone. And that's exactly what I've done by starting my own league, by independently scouting, by, by learning how to evaluate talent. Even when I was playing, you know, I was exposed to all those things. So my career has been, I think, a microcosm of all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so those are experiences and experience that I bring to the table that other people can't. And then on top of that, I played the game. So I've seen it from clo from 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 that that forty thousand foot range, yeah. and I've seen it from right there in my face. So there are things that I can bring to the table that no other other GM candidate can, because I understand the dynamics of fan uh, fan support. I understand the dynamics of having uh, the connection with the team uh, and, and the generational gaps that are there. You know, with a lot of these older coaches and a lot of these older GMs. It's always been, this is how we've done things, but mm -hmm. it's time to start changing that. And then I also understand the dynamics of uh, running an organization from top to bottom. So uh, I don't think there'll be a more complete 
uh, candidate that'll walk through a door, uh, you know, with these teams that need general managers at this time. Thinking of my listeners of why we work, and we'll get some more questions about this later, but this seems like a dream for you. And it's something, do they know you're knocking on the door? Like, is this something that's ongoing with you or you're just, you're just waiting your turn. You're just, you know, getting your ducks all lined up in a row and just waiting for that opportune moment. How is it in your mind working to, you know, bang down that door? Well, I liken what I'm doing to the art of war. I liken what I'm doing to a chess game um, because of the different moves that I'm making, the different ways that I, I've always done what I've done uh, by being unconventional. The same way I made it to the NFL the first time is what we're doing now. Uh, I'm taking a lot of that social proof from that movement um, and being the guy that everybody looked at as crazy and you'll never make it. Scouts were like, nah, you'll never make it. But I did. And eventually, you know, as an organizer of the Players, Players All-Star Classic in Little Rock, Arkansas, which was a bowl game that we put on uh, to help athletes go to the next level, all of those scouts that scouted me and told me that I'd never make it were there. And they were shocked when they found out that that was my game. So <laughs> those are the things that I do, you know, in regards to the level of respect, uh, the, the, the level of admiration for, for what we put together. Uh, and it's, it's, it's social proof, you know, as far as being able to connect with the fans. You know, I've, I've set forth, uh, you know, fan re-engagement initiatives um, almost eight, nine months ago when it came down to the Houston Texans organization because of the fact that I have a vested interest in it in an organization. And there were a ton of petitions out that were, you know, calling for boycotting the team. And, and you know as well as I know, if, if people are boycotting the team, that means they're not spending money with the organization anymore. Mm -hmm. And eventually the organization takes so many financial hits that they have to sell. Yeah. And the fact that I'm a former player, you know, that for me that felt like that my – my uh, energy and effort and blood, sweat, and tears would have gone in vain. So what I did was I said, let me start a petition. And, and with this petition, I'm going to raise my hand and I'm going to get in front of these fans and I'm going to eventually get in front of the, the upper management and, and owners of the organization again. Uh, and they would be able to see, you know, not only am I passionate about it, but with this passion comes a plan. I mean, a clear and concise plan um, for, the, for the team itself and how I can help on all areas, in all areas, in all, all facets of this thing. Uh, and I also got in front of the fans that were just, I mean, they were, it's been pretty rough, but it's been cool <laughs> because yeah. the fans themselves are passionate. Yeah. And when I said I wanted to be the next general manager, you know, of course, what's your experience? Who are you? And all these different things. But I had to really be patient enough with the fans mm -hmm. to meet them where they were. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in being in leadership roles, you have to have those type of qualities. And man, some of the, some of the worst people you can think of uh, when it came down to, you know, just coming after me, we're, we're, we're good friends now. Mm -hmm. and it's cool, man. And, and I love them. And I want them to be a part of the movement as well. Uh, but yeah, man, I, I'm in front of a, a good amount of uh, support, signatures, uh, followers to where when I come through the door, um, I'm myself outside of being a player anymore. I can, you know, potentially generate 12.5 to $13 million per game just from the, the, the motions and the, the movement and the, and the, and the, and the presence that I've had off the field right now in this moment, you know, with COVID going on and being in front of these fans. Um, and, and, and I'm, I'm acting as if I'm a general manager right now. And that's the only way that you're going to have, uh, any success in this league is to, is to say that this is your position. Uh, so there isn't anybody that's putting in the work that I'm putting in. Uh, and of course, you know, with the time differences in us, there's nobody up right now talking about this <laughs> except for us and myself, right? So you want somebody like me to head your team because your team will take on my characteristics. And, and, and all I know is making a history that other people read about. And, and I don't doubt you at all. Like, that's the funny thing. I appreciate it, man. What about the pressure? I mean, a GM, you know, the team's doing bad, fire the GM. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, you know? that's a part of it, man. I mean, I think pressure comes, and, and Peyton Manning said it best, pressure comes when you don't know what the hell you're doing. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I do. And, and, I, and I know I do, which gives me the confidence and, and, and the concise, conciseness and the clarity 
when it comes down to making decisions and doing different things, because I understand what the workload is. Um, I have well over 400 years of successful NFL uh, uh, football operations behind me in regards to the people that are in my corner, Mm -hmm. uh, the mentors, mentee relationships that I have right now. I mean, some of the best in the business, these people have sought me out, you know, just because of my conviction and the things that I, I, I want to do and how I want to change the game. Uh, and they're a part of it. And those guys will come in the building with me. So I already have a team assembled. Uh, um, I have uh, uh, various options when it comes down to helping with the bottom line. Uh, and then also the culture. You know, I'm really big on that culture situation. And, and it's unfortunate that the fans and a lot of people look at things through the emotional lens when you really have to look at it from a logical standpoint when it comes down to business. So when the bullets are live, man, I'm cool. I'm calm. I'm collected. Uh, because I understand that that's a part of the game, and that's what I learned by playing. You can never be too high and never be too low. Uh, you're going to have some bad plays, but in those bad plays, there's a lesson, but you have to have a short memory when it comes down to going to the next play. And as a leader, if people are looking at you for leadership, you know, and they see you, you know, they see you fidgeting and, and you're unsure, we have a problem, and that'll never happen with me at any level. I believe you have the confidence to do what you're setting out to do, but there are difficult times. What is, what is difficult or some challenge that you face, whether in the league, um, helping out athletes, uh, any of the, the presidential roles that you hold, or even going seeking a GM position? What, what are some difficulties that, or a challenge that you maybe even just foresee? Um, well, there again, Anything that I do um, is about progress, mm -hmm. uh, is about taking that potential and turning that into something greater. Uh, it, it's, it's not about losses, it's about lessons. If you get the, the, the mental mindset of everybody around you focused on that one singular goal, no matter what a problem may be, um, I call them you know, opportunities. Mm -hmm. So it's about, it's about perspective. People look at what I've gone through and, and, and how I bounced back and how I made it to the NFL and all these different things. And that was because I had the right perspective. You know, uh, a no to me is just one more no closer to that yes that's going to change everybody's lives. So you have to be able to ooze that confidence and people look at you and say, you know what, even though this is a, a tight situation and something is going on, you know, I, I feel confident about what's going on in the leadership that is here. Uh, so there really aren't any problems in my world. You know, I, I, I eliminate the words, but hope maybe uh, rebuild all those different things. And, and you have to have that mindset uh, when you are a leader, you have to be able to look at things realistically and remove the emotional content from your decision-making and, and, and your people have to believe in that. So there has to be a level of belief in you in order to change the game and change the world. Um, and, and that's been, you know, that's been my MO you know, as long as I can remember. And, and when people really get behind it and really look at things, it's about growth. It's about being uncomfortable. It's like in the gym, you know, if you're in the gym and you're not uncomfortable and sweating and, and, and getting better, uh, you're in the way. And, and we need that machine because we're working <laughs> and that's, that's how it works. So it's, it's really common sense, man. It's a common yeah. sense approach. And unfortunately common sense isn't, isn't so Damn. common nowadays, but, you know, it, it's a it's a common sense approach with me. Um, you know, like I say, I'm never too high, never too low. I understand that there will be challenges, um, but they're never problems, man. You know, we can we can get over anything. You know, you wake up in the morning, you got a chance to overcome anything. So as long as we up and we moving, we'll get through it. We're doing all right. Thinking of who you're helping in the athletes, what is some satisfaction that you're seeing, you know, in the few years that you've been doing this in helping them just have a better or a broader horizon of their future? For me, oh man, you know, I think one of the, the, the main questions that I get, you know, from my developmental league is how many athletes have made it to the NFL? And I laugh because we've had guys that had sniffs at the NFL. But more importantly for me, the numbers that, that I look at and that I uh, count is the number of business owners, yeah. is the number of guys that have been in motion pictures and movies 
and, and, and commercials playing football players who are now principals in, 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 in these productions. Um, the number of athletes that, you know, our family men now that have started with us and have evolved and, and are now investors. Um, and, and those are the numbers that I give them because that's the main thing. You know, if you really look at it, there are going to be far more business owners and far more pillars of the community uh, in what we do than guys are going to go to the NFL because that's how it's structured. Everyone can't go to the NFL. So with us knowing that, our numbers are a little bit different. Um, you know, we have guys that are going to get that look, you know, and we have, you know, the different scouts. And, you know, just from my career alone, I have over 400, I'll say 425 individuals that I've either played with, been coached by, uh, or, or guys that, you know, I know from different organizations that I'm able to, to call up and say, hey, uh, I have a guy, I need you to look at him. We put together a book of business on him on the, on the field with his film, with the various positions, and then we have a book of business on him uh, what, and, and what he does off the field. And here you go. And this is a complete package. Um, so, so I think those are the things that are really satisfactory to me is to, is to watch my guys grow up and, and still be yeah. in tune with what we talked about earlier. And, and now all of those guys are a part of this movement and this push because they're duplicating the processes that I've shown, that we've shown, um, and, and they're putting it out there. Uh, in their social media spaces and, and with the people that they, that they know and, and, and they understand what it is that I'm doing when it comes down to social proof. Um, in order to be a leader, you have to be a servant leader. And, and that's, that's what my life has been about. Uh, and, and these guys and these, and these families know it. And, and that's the, I think that's the most gratifying thing for me is to, is to watch everybody come through and, and, and become successful in their own right and have an opportunity to, to, to go from wanting to be a player to wanting to be an owner of a team or owner of a league and, and own, you know, businesses, residential and commercial real estate, franchises, that's the space that we play in. Is it, is it a far-fetched idea of mine? Because what you're, you're working with are young men. And mm -hmm. so they're not, you know, maybe in their teens, but 20 something. Is it a far-fetched to have what you're doing package it up into a program and present it to high schools for not just athletes, but for, for students. Absolutely. No, no, no. It's, it, that, this is what we've done. That's why we've set the curriculum up the way we, we have, because we have a men's division, we have a women's division, we have a youth division. And ultimately what will happen is with the different divisions, we will be able to take this curriculum and, and, and take it to high schools. Take it to colleges. I mean, I would have loved and, this in high school. Man, you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. And, and that's what we bring to the table. We bring that practical knowledge. We bring that lesson plan, you know, from what we've gone through and, and the hardships and the pitfalls and, and the lessons and all those different things. And, and, and we've packaged it up in such a way to where it's digestible for anybody. And, and that's, that's what this thing is about. Well, I say that about high school. I'd like to have it now. Man, <laughs> listen. It's it's a wonderful thing, man. We 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 we've been able to make some strides, man. So it's it's been a cool ride, but it's just getting started. Garrick Jones, what would you like people to understand about you? What I mean, whether the younger you, the athletic you, the professional you, or the business you, the GM future, not even hopeful, but future GM you, to understand right. who you are, to get a better appreciation of what it is you're trying to do and accomplish. I would just like for people to know that, you know, this is something bigger than myself. This is something God gave me um, that, you know, with, with that, you know, it's, it's about progress. You know, I'm not into making points. I'm into making progress. And, and in that progress, I'm into helping people in, in ways that they never have thought about being helped or even thought about, you know, going. Um, my thing is about wanting more for people than they want for themselves. Uh, like I said before, man, I'm a servant leader. And in that leadership, you know, I've learned so much about myself, learned so much about my family uh, and, and everything that, that is going on. So I'm, I'm in the bridging the gap between fans and, and bringing them into the family and, and with these current and former players that they grew up idolizing uh, and, and these organizations to where we all win and we all eat and we eat well and, and we use sports uh, itself, whether it be football, baseball, uh, the NBA, whatever. 
our platforms fit directly in those those spaces and and from there with that level of exposure and education we can actually change the world uh through sports because sports brings everybody together so why not make sure everybody understands what's going on and how to uh deal with these diverse issues that we have out here today uh and and that's really my main focus is to is to be a beacon of light uh and just be somebody that people can look at and say man you know he he, he was really a good guy and that's it <laughs> Sports truly does bring people together because right. when COVID first hit and there was no sports, this was a pretty sad <laughs> right. place. Right. You mentioned about you are of progress. How do you stay productive with your, you're balancing a bunch of things. You're doing a bunch of things and COVID mm -hmm. might put a little slant to it, slow things down where it does for some, maybe not for you, but how do you stay productive? How do you get up and what's, what's driving you forward? Uh, I think for me, man, it's it's about being intentional every day and having a good team around you. You know, I've constructed uh, and put together a nice team, you know, for what we have going on. And in doing so, that has given me the chance to to spread my wings even more uh, as a leader of this organization, the States Developmental Football League, and being president of the Huddle Up Foundation of Houston, uh, being on the board when it comes down to the NFLPA Houston chapter, uh, in any other endeavor that I have going on, it's about surrounding yourself with with people that uh, sharpen you, and and that's what I've been able to do, you know. And I've been real intentional about everything that I have going on to where, when when we really make moves and, and things happen, it's not hard. And I was explaining this to a colleague of mine uh, the other day. They were like, "Man, you have a lot going on." I'm like you have no clue of what I had going on. And those are the things that I used to talk about with my agent. And mm -hmm. you can check a lot of the articles, you know, that, that I've had in the past. And my agent would always say, this guy has a tremendous amount of energy. I don't know how he does it. Uh, it's just about having the right people around you and, and being able to delegate. And, and, and from there, continuing to grow. Because in business, if you want to grow your business, one of the first things you do is find somebody that's going to replace you. Um, so I set things up for people to come in and replace me so I can go out and, and pro procure more for everybody. And that's just what I'm about. In staying productive, what, what is a tool that you use? What is something that keeps you most efficient? What is it something that you need? Um, for me, it's about communication. Um, there's a lot of programs that I use, but one in particular is Equilibrium in Sports, where mm -hmm. I'm learning how to give people what they need in regards to their uh, e-colors and, and their tendencies and those types of things like that. Uh, and, and with those things and learning how to, learning how to uh, intentionally communicate, that helps me in everyday scenarios and situations when I would interact with people early on, you know, I would just be interacting with them. But now knowing all the things that I know, I interact with them to learn more about them and in turn learn more about myself and, and, and putting us all in a position to win. Um, and that's, that's really my deal. You know, just trying to learn how to communicate with people, you know, even better than I have in the past. Thinking of other people and my listeners as well, what is a, a tip or some advice you have for people getting into work? Maybe you can think of, you know, whether they're going to start their lawn mowing business with their dad, they're going to get into some interesting career, which may turn into something else. What right. Is a tip <laughs> that you might have for, uh, for my listeners, people getting into work. Oh man. Um, finding something that you're passionate about. You know, that's, I think that's one of the biggest things. If you are able to get into a, uh, I would say a job or a career yeah. um, or anything that you're passionate about, that'll definitely help you when times are hard, because it gives you a foundational structure. Uh, and then from there, being able to take that passion and apply that to your plan, and it's your roadmap. And that gives you the guidelines for how to go. Even when times are tough, you can always go back to that plan. Uh, and that's your structure. It's just like in business, you have a business plan for a reason. And if you have the right leadership, people buy into the leadership and then you got a business plan. So whenever things get haywire, you can always go back to that business plan and get back on track. Uh, but it starts with passion, man. You know, be passionate about every day. Be intentional. We're not promised another second, you know. So take it full advantage of it. Take 
full advantage of people that want to help you um, and, and understand that it's a, it's a teamwork atmosphere. You can't do it by yourself. Uh, so teamwork really does make the dream work. So I live by those principles, man. And, and I just try to live that every day. And, and that's really helped me in everything and all the endeavors that I, I've taken on in my life. Speaking of endeavors and other endeavors besides work, how do you make those work life choices to keep everything in check? You know, giving yourself some free time because you said you were so busy at one time and still busy now. But yeah. how do you how do you decide and decipher between okay, work time has to stop and now it's more family or playtime right. or rest time? Right. Right. Everybody's situation is different. You had to kind of assess you know, what your situation is, because what will work for me may not work for somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely in an entrepreneurial, ambitious mind state or space, that's a that's ugly. You know, that's really an ugly scenario. Right, right, right. Because you're going to work twice to three times as hard for yourself than you'll work for anybody else. Um, so it, it's different. Uh, but it's all about finding what works for you and just being intentional about what what does work for you. And then from there, finding the different things, like one of the things that I do and I used to do and I learned back in college, no matter about the classes and having to go to practice, I would take, you know, 15 minutes and find a squirrel or a bird. And I just watched them. And that would kind of center me. And I still do this to this day. Uh, I haven't done it as much as I should uh, because of all the things I have going on. But um, that was, those, was, those are some of the things I used to do. Just really simple moment, things. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cause it, it, it kind of, it, it brings you back to reality and, and, and it gives you a, I want to say a really a simplistic idea at that particular time saying, man, that bird or that, that squirrel that's running around, you know, they're, they're frolicking and they're free. Um, but here I am, you know, with all these different problems, everything's going on. But if you really sit down and look at it, I can live my life like that as well, you know, within all of everything that's going on within these storms and those types of things. So you just have to be, you know, really intentional about you and, and self-preservation. And that's what that thing is about. It's saying, since you said you haven't done it in a while, <clears throat> I was reading a book to my kids or something. And in it was a girl and her, her mom, and there was a, a flower of some sort and there was a sound mm -hmm. inside of it and there was a bee stuck inside. Mm -hmm. So I've never seen such a thing. It was in the book. And then one day I went to work and I was walking by a tree and I hear bzzz, and inside <laughs> was a bee stuck in this flower. And I was just standing there in amazement. I mean, right, huh? <laughs> in the flower and all this. And then in the book, the good little girl let it out so that the bee can go get some more honey. So I opened it up and the bee went out. It's just those little things. And someone I'm sure looking from the window, like, what is this guy doing <laughs> looking at a flower? Right, exactly. I mean, you... <laughs> Right. You see, you seem out of your mind to people, you know, you seem yeah. out of your mind a lot of times because they haven't allowed themselves the opportunity to think on it on, on that simplistic level. And once people do that, man, it, it, I mean, it just, you can go on about your day a little bit better. You know what I'm saying? So I get it. That better perspective on, on. Some I get it. And right. Re Absolutely. Rebalances some things in a way. Wait, is there anything that you wish you would have known? I mean, your program seems like, from my perspective, if I was working with you, everything mm -hmm. that you're setting up in your program is all the things I wish I would have known. So right. is there anything in particular that you wish you would have known that you would have told yourself, but you can tell other people now that they might or should consider in work? Well, for me, Brian, to be honest with you, I, I think... I am where I need to be or where I'm supposed to be. Um, and if I would have known all of this stuff early on, you know, who, who knows what would have happened? You know, I probably would have been, you know, hoarding all this, you know, information and, and, and perspective and everything and not really sharing with people, you know, and, and we all know that that's no good. You know, you have to be able to learn and then share and, and help people grow as well. So I always look back on certain things and I was like, you know, what if I knew, then what I know now. And then I always come back to the realization that if that would have happened, I would not be the same person I am today, you know? And, and I, I think, I think we're in a good spot, man. We're making the noise that we need to make and, and teaching uh, uh, the way we need to, the way we need to teach rather. So, 
you know, that, I think that's kind of the answer to that question, man. I, I look at it sometimes, but I, I wouldn't change a thing, to be honest with you, my friend. The idea of career and character, where can you say the, the temptation lies or the pull lies? And I, I can just take it from your this interview and conversation with you that you put mm -hmm. your character above your career. But for a lot of people, and maybe yourself included, I know for me, is like the title, right? Whatever the title is, you know, I wish I can get there. How do you keep that um, in check to make sure you're putting the right foot forward each time and you're not being led by the allurements or um, the accolades and anything else that right. might come before you? It's just having a good a good grounding, a good base, a good foundation. Um, I'm a, I'm a regular guy, to be honest with you, man. You people will look at all the things that I've done, but when they sit down and talk to me, they're like, "Wow, you know." Just my thing with football, even though I'm a former player, you would talk, or you could talk to me for hours, and I may not discuss an X and an O yeah. uh, with you because I, I feed off of your energy and where the conversation needs to go first before I start talking about certain things. So business, uh, just levels of success, you know, however you want to rank it. Uh, I think for me, it's always just been about, you know, being a genuine person. Uh, you know, I genuinely want to see people in, in better places that, than, than when they got here. And that's my thing. I genuinely want to leave this, this world um, better than when I got here. And, and I know that it can happen because you know, I'm a change agent. You know, I'm all about, finding ways to do things better, uh, finding ways to, 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 to make more of an impact, whether it be social impact, whether it be economic impact, all those things. And that's really my, my foundation and my base. Uh, I've just been blessed enough along the way to, to, to get some titles and, you know, and all those things. But, man, I'm really a down-to-earth guy. Yeah. And, and people find that out really quickly when they talk to me. It doesn't take more than five minutes for people to say, oh, he's a little different. Now we can really talk to him, you know. And it's, it's cool. There's, this is a little off topic, but you mentioned about making things better. And I know you do work mm -hmm. on helmets with trying to reduce concussions. And it's right. something I've, uh, another thing I've wanted to ask someone for a while. And I noticed that you're, you're involved with that. Why don't we have helmets with a little bit of rubber or something on the outside rather right. than plastic? Is there a reason for that? Well, I think the Just reason and rationale bit, yeah. behind that is the 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 weight of the helmet. Yeah. Um, trying to find lighter components that will be able to absorb like a rubber would. Yeah. And those are some of the things that we're testing, you know, with impact sports. Uh, really trying to figure out the best way to make sure that the helmet is light enough for these youngsters to wear while they're developing and playing, but also for the helmet itself to be um safe enough to 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 dampen those blows and reduce the numbers of concussions so it's it's all about having a um i want to say just thinking outside of the box yeah uh when it comes down to different things because man realistically as far as i can remember i've had nine concussions and 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 people ask me why do i work so hard uh when it comes down to the th things that i do why am i always thinking because i know from my experiences and, and, and having teammates that aren't doing well, that if I slow down and if I really don't use my mind um, as much as I'm doing right now, within six months, it, it, this would be a totally different conversation. And, and that's the hardest thing for me uh, mm -hmm. because that's hard every day because of the, the, the type of damage that I've done to myself and, yeah. and the game has done to me. Um, we want to make it better because you should never have a reduced quality of life uh, from anything that you do um, in, in, in the entertainment industry. And we've entertained millions and millions of people. Um, and there are a lot of guys hurt. And I have teammates that they're not doing well, man. And, and that, that drives me to continue to keep going and keep going because there are days when my kids have to finish my sentences. You know, even though I may be articulate, I have to work at this. Like, like I'm playing the game. I mean, I'm, I'm practicing talking. I'm practicing thinking, I'm practicing mind games, and it shouldn't be like that, you know? And, and, and that's where the whole helmet situation comes from. We just want to make the game as safe as possible yeah. uh, to where, you know, a lot of these athletes won't be going through what I'm going through and what uh, so many other guys are going through. 
Speaking of just continually with learning and lifelong learning, where are you with education, whether it's formal or informal, just even thinking of being an athlete and learning on the field, um, learning from the coaches, but also in a business position continually. Mm -hmm. Where are you with education itself? Well, for me, uh, I, I try to learn as much as possible all the time. You know, I, I took the situation with COVID and the qu quarantine and I said, well, since we have to be quarantined, I guess I will learn as much as I, I can as possible uh, about leadership and management, about the things that I've already been doing, um, scouting, general manager practices, uh, sports psychology, you know, every free course that is was, that was offered, I was taking it. Uh, my executive uh, business management and executive coaching from Babson College, uh, the different things I was doing with Harvard University, with the NFL, anything that I could do, you know, as far as this uh, certification programs, as far as uh, the, the programs that the NFLPA trust offer, as far as the NFL offers, you know, I was trying to take all of those different things because I knew that, you know, from what I was doing and how I have things structured, to go through these uh, uh, courses and just learn as much as possible was going to help me. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially utilizing the time with COVID, you know, just, I put my head down and I think I brought home maybe, I want to say 12 certifications. I finished uh, uh, leadership and management uh, diploma course through, uh, through, through Shaw University. Um, I did a lot, right? All throughout the whole time, I was just working, you know, because we couldn't do anything else. So, you know, my thing was making sure that I'm able to bring that and that be a part of the, the, the testimony and the lesson plan when I talk yeah. to people, yeah. like utilizing Absolutely. your time, you know, for the, for, you know, for the greater good for everything you have going on. There's a lot. I mean, that's great. There's a lot of people and you know, too, that just are not using their time efficiently not right, it's right, just like right. oh COVID. watching some news <laughs> programs seeing how bad it is and in the meantime right. do a whole bunch of things whether you had money right. or no money you know just go online and learn something there you go and, and and what was crazy was so many of these ivy league universities were offering free courses i mean free courses like really really in-depth these were their course offerings, you know, and, and, and I jumped at it, man. I, I, I've completed so many courses from Yale, from Harvard. Uh, I, I, man, I tried to hit as many Ivy League schools as possible because I wanted to see if I really knew what I was talking about. And I was OK. I, 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 I didn't know that. that. That's that's pretty amazing. I didn't know that. that there. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Jeez, it was a lot, man. I mean, that's that was my thing. You know, I, I got to the point where that I was I just I couldn't get enough knowledge. You know, I was a sponge. And that, that goes back to what I was saying about the concussions and all those different things. I, yeah. I really have to push myself. And that's a part of helping me uh, through, through this process of, of knowing my body has had some trauma and knowing my brain has had some trauma. So I really have to work at it. So, well, I'm going to like, I think my brain has some trauma too. And that's not making it, it's <laughs> right. not making a joke, but like it's right. really hard to focus, to read to to really ingest you know maybe you know not maybe but certainly reading again or reading it right. loud just so it's really going in there so i think mm -hmm. what you're saying is is perfect for this as well of people no matter what sort of difficulty if you have a desire to learn or if you don't mm -hmm. have a desire to learn you should have a desire to learn but right. it, with with learning don't give up right, right. keep trying right. because you or i it doesn't matter we can get through it if you have a desire, even even if you have to do audio books and all of those types of things. It, I love them. It's all all a good way to to learn something, especially if you have a passion for something. Garrick Jones, how can people reach you, sir? I tell people all the time that they can search me on any search engine. Um, they can put in my name, Garrick Jones, uh, put the NFL next to it, and everything I'm doing will pop up. Uh, you know, for my petition and a lot of other things that I'm doing, um, they can search out the hashtag GJ, the number four GM. And what will happen is everything that I'm doing, everything that I'm posting social media wise will pop up. Um, you'll, you'll get a chance to, to find my uh, situation with the Huddle Up Foundation of Houston. Uh, you'll find the SDFL, which is the State's Developmental Football League. Um, you'll see a lot of stuff from the NFLPA. Uh, and then, of course, you'll see 
uh, my situation from uh, the petition to be the next general manager of the Houston Texans or general manager in the, in, in, in the actual NFL itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and from there, once you go and you can, you guys can kind of, you guys can go to change.org and, and put my name in the search engine and that petition will come up. And what I've done with that petition is made that like an electronic press kit where you get all of my articles, uh, you get all of my interviews. I mean, once this one is done, I'll have that posted on there and I'm, I'm making that a, a, a catch all where everybody can go there and see all of the different things that I have going on, learn about the petition, uh, learn about me in business, my LinkedIn profile, uh, and, and, and everything. So that's uh, change.org. And just in the search engine, put in Garrick Jones and my petition will come up. Please guys sign it, you know, comment on it. Uh, and, and the more, the more, the, the more signatures I have, the better, uh, cause those signatures are like currency. So, and it helps me in, in what we're doing with the NFL and trying to get, get back into the NFL, you know, whether it be with the Houston Texans or the Atlanta Falcons or, or any of the other teams that are needing some, some good transformational leadership. And it's time to make those moves. And, and I, I look forward to being, you know, the guy that, that heads that, that, that movement. I would say any place warm. Down. <laughs> <laughs> right. You take right. anyone. I, I know. Garrick Jones, I have one final question for you, sir. And that is, why do you work? Well, I work to leave a legacy. Um, when my grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents passed away, um, they didn't leave us anything. You know, they worked hard for other people, and unfortunately, they didn't have anything. You know, so I learned how to work hard for my parents and you know with my parents being a little more forward thinking we'll, we will be left with something um but i look at the generations that come after me like my my children's children um i want to be able to leave a blueprint for them that they can take and that they can give to their kids um and from there just that legacy and and and, and generational wealth of knowledge and generational wealth of, of finances and and give them an opportunity to be successful. And, and that way, they would be able to carve out their own lanes and be their own trailblazers and pioneers. And, and I just want to inspire not only my family, but all families. I want to inspire all people. Um, I understand and I understood early on that every movement needs a sacrificial lamb. And, and I feel like that I, I am that sacrifice when it comes down to the different things that I've had to omit in my life. Um, but you know, that's the reason why I do what I do. That's my why, you know, my children, you know, they, they are the reason why, you know, my, 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 my wife, just my family, um, making sure that they're okay. And, and I'm a provider. So that that's it, man. That's me in a nutshell. Well, you, you are leaving a blueprint and I think that blueprint will definitely have an impact and we, we, should, you, all, we should all appreciate a sacrificial lamb. I, I would say amen to that. And Thank Garrett you, Jones, the future general manager of the team to yet to be announced. <laughs> Thank you man. for your time, kind sir. I appreciate it immensely. Thank you, man. You have a good one, man.